Hello, and thanks for joining today. I uh, appreciate everyone joining live on LinkedIn or on YouTube, or if you're watching this again in the future, welcome to the past recording. Uh, today, we'll be talking about building a digital sales funnel for your business. Um, so some of you might already be familiar with this term. For some people, this might be a new term. Basically, it's all about looking at how to build your sales strategy uh, kind of in line with a marketing strategy that leverages digital channels. So we'll pop right in. Um, I should note too, we will have time for questions at the end of the webinar. Um, so feel free to pop those into the chat as they come up and I'd be happy to um, enter those as we get to the end of the presentation today. So this is a table of contents we're gonna go through today. Uh, very first thing will be what is digital sales? So kind of defining what that is. Then we'll be talking about why it's important and why you should take it seriously for your business or organization. And then we will jump into the actual funnel itself and the different setup that I have that I use with my clients as far as building out their digital sales funnel. We'll talk about how to get started and then have, again, some time for questions and answers at the end of the presentation. So real quick, if you don't know me, uh, I'm James Roloff. Um, I'm the consultant owner at Roloff Consulting. Um, I've been in the world of online business uh, for over 20 years now doing different website things. Um, nine plus years in sales management, uh, working at my previous firm, Powder Keg. Um, I have an MBA in organizational change um, from Edgewood. And I've, I've worked with you know over 100 clients now over the years. Um, likely some people on this presentation have worked with me uh, in one fashion or another during that time. So what is digital sales? We're kind of used to the concept of digital transformation in other parts of our lives. Um, so things like the old film cameras becoming uh, the, shall I'll get myself here too so you can see my pretty face. Um, we're used to digital transformation in other parts of our lives. So things like film cameras became smartphone cameras, right? They, they became digitized. Things like CDs or VHS or Blu-rays, that's all done through online streaming services now. Things like writing postcards and writing mails. Obviously, people still do that. I get some nice holiday cards every year, so thank you for everyone who sends those. Um, but we're now we use email for that for the most part, right? We have digitally transformed the way we do lots of things in our lives, both in our personal lives and in our business lives. And as part of that process, we gain a lot of efficiencies uh, in the process of going from analog to digital. We also gain a lot of effectiveness too. And the fact that we can do our job better, not just because it's faster, but also because it's easier for us and for the end consumer we're working with too. So these are kind of things we're used to in our personal lives. Uh, but when it comes to the, the sales world, sales is still a very manual labor process. Um, and hopefully, you know, people on the call here or in, or in the sales world don't act like the dude on the uh, the left side of the screen there and be kind of like that, that begrudgingly angry uh, door to door salesman. But the reality is sales is transforming too. And people don't want someone coming to their door and harassing them about things. They want to go online. They want to do research. They want to engage with brands online, engage with salespeople online, and they're used to that digital process. And so that's a big part of digital sales is transforming the way you do sales from more analog things to more of the digital side of things. So how do I define digital sales? I say digital sales is simply the sales activities are connected or conducted through digital channels. And so it's a very broad term, but it's really using things that include software, hardware, and networks to conduct sales activities um, in your organization. So just some examples I have here, um, you know, more traditional things are things like networking events, trade shows, phone calls, print advertising, live in-person meetings and in-person events, brochures, business cards, all that stuff. On the digital side of things, you have things like social media, email, uh, websites, virtual meetings, CRM software, market intelligence software, and automation. So things like chatbots as well, too. I should note here that you don't stop doing the traditional things. Um, you know, there's plenty of value in a lot of those traditional activities. Um, and you might find for your business, some of those traditional activities work really well, but you're trying to supplement them or in some cases replace and transform them with digital activities, knowing that they're going to be more effective um, and they're going to make you more successful and make the experience better for your buyer too. So why is digital sales important? I have some facts here. These are from a study from Forrester Research. So 92% of B2B purchases start with online search. Again, a lot of people on this call are probably familiar with that when you're doing stuff for your business. 
more likely than not, the first thing you do is go online and Google something, probably not Bing, but you go online, you start searching things um, or YouTube a lot, you know, very popular thing nowadays too. If you're looking for views or trying to find out how to solve a problem, you'll go right on online search and try and find the answers there. 63% of B2B buyers finalize a vendor list based solely on digital content. So again, this is absolutely huge. And when you think about the ramifications of this, that means more than half of B2B buyers do not reach out to a salesperson before they finalize their list of vendors they might work with. So if you're not even on the radar, if you don't have visibility in digital channels, you're not even getting that chance at that project or at that product or purchase that person's trying to make. So that's a huge implication, which if I'm sitting in an executive seat uh, for business and I'm looking at where I'm trying to put my money, that puts a lot of emphasis on digital content, digital marketing, and on digital sales too. 72% of B2B social sellers outperform peers who don't social sell. So this goes more down to actual strategy and tactics and for individual sales reps, as far as whether or not they're doing social selling using things like LinkedIn or Twitter or Facebook to build their audience, publish content, interact with their end buyers directly on those social platforms. So again, the stat here, basically just saying people who do those things, people who use digital platforms to social sell will outperform, you know, in more cases than not people who don't do that. So why implement digital sales? A couple of main reasons here, right? So buyers want digital. Our consumers, our end buyers want that digital experience. They're already using digital channels to search and research and vet their vendors. So they want to be able to go to your website, go to your social platforms, and interact with you on a digital basis. It provides major leverage for you as a business. So it's taking things that you're already doing and leveraging those by using digital channels, using software, using hardware, and using networks to do your job more effectively. Then the obvious thing there is that you close more deals, right? So you're going to be more effective. You're going to increase your sales, increase your donations. If you're a nonprofit, um, basically you're going to do a better job of doing sales by leveraging these platforms and meeting your customers where they want to be from that digital experience standpoint. So to kind of summarize, there's two main things that I say I kind of take away from that whole digital sales experience. So number one, it's about building trust and showing empathy. Because at the end of the day, we are still selling to people. I think a lot of times we, the digital or digitization of things can kind of abstract things from us. So all of a sudden we don't feel like we're dealing with people anymore. But the truth is sellers and salespeople and marketers that matter are still dealing with people. And digital channels are a great way to connect in this new world that we're living in. Number two is that you can effectively find, convert and sell more deals, right? So the goal of all of us here is to have profitable sales and that's what you can do more with digital sales techniques. So now we're gonna dive into the actual digital sales funnel, um, the framework that I created that I use with my clients, I've used personally for my own business development um, that will kind of outline some things that you can do uh, again in your organization that'll help you build up that digital sales strategy. So my digital sales funnel is this. It's a the very top of the funnel, you have educate, the middle you have capture, and the bottom you have consult. This is a digital sales funnel that really focuses on building awareness at the very top, reaching as many people as possible through educational content, capturing those leads in the middle, and then converting them through consultative sales. So what that means at the very top, it's all about educational content because people want to learn things online. They go to Google, they go to social media, they look at YouTube, they try and find things to get answers for problems they're having. So your goal at the top of your digital sales funnel is to be the best educator you possibly can be. In that middle of the funnel, it's all about capturing leads by providing call to actions that provide value. So offering something of value, whether it be a guide, whether it be a webinar, whether it be literally like let's meet, let's have a, a consultative meeting or discovery meeting that I can help you, you know, answer some of your common questions. Um, so providing some sort of call to action or multiple different call to actions that allow you to offer value to someone you've already educated at the top of that funnel. At the bottom then you have be a consultant, not a salesperson. So I really wanna emphasize this, that people that come through digital channels are not looking to be sold to. They've already been doing research, they're trying to learn more, they're kind of uh, DIY kind of people. That's why they went through digital channels versus reaching out to sales reps in the first place. So at the very bottom of that funnel, it's really important you do consultative selling and treat yourself as a one-on-one -on -one consultant working with your customer, working with your prospective customer 
answering their questions, and then helping them solve their specific business problems. So at the very top of the funnel, you're not solving specific business problems. You're just answering questions and educating. The very bottom of the funnel, it's more one-on-one -on -one and looking at individual businesses, the problem they're having, the impact it's having on their business, and the kind of solution you can provide to them. Um, so by the time you're done talking to them, it's a no-brainer. They want to move forward with you because um, you've helped them see that path of solving that problem in their business. So now what we're going to do then is just go through each stage of those funnels one by one. And I'm just going to talk about tactics that I recommend organizations use within each one of those stages. Um, I should note there's a lot of slides, a lot of different suggestions I kind of throw at you here. Um, the key I want you to kind of take away is that um, you want to look at your business and see what makes the most sense for you to implement based on your strategy and how you want to adopt things. But I just want to throw ideas at you today so that as you walk away from this uh, webinar, you might have some good ideas that how you might want to do things in your business. So the very again, top is educate. This is all about expanding your reach by providing educational content online. So the goal here is expand your reach. The measurement is impressions. So it can be impressions on web pages. It can be impressions on social posts. It can be impressions on emails you send out. It's basically just trying to get eyeballs on your content so that you can help educate people on things that are relevant to your industry. So these are different components um, that I tend to focus on when it comes to educate. So buyer personas, content strategy, social selling, search engine optimization, events and webinars, and email campaigns. So we'll walk through each one of those now um, individually. So customer personas. I always, always, always start with this when it comes to working with clients and making sure that they have a defined customer persona. And this is um, in the world of educating, this is your student, right? This is the person that you are trying to teach um, you know, your, your industry and answer the questions that they might have. So um, I kind of treat this as the student that you're trying to build it out. So who they are, why they buy, what they buy, and how they buy it are kind of the common questions you want to answer when building out personas. Um, I do have a whole separate little mini course on my website just on building out your persona. I have a template for it and stuff too. So you can check that out if you haven't gone through exercise yet for your business. Um, the key takeaway here, though, is that you want to make this person real. You don't want to say, you know, my persona is someone age 35 to 45 that lives in, you know, the Midwest. That's not a person. That, that's kind of a general average of people. You want to say I'm working, you know, my, my persona is a 38 year old female who lives in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. That's a much more exact persona versus the average. So I'm going to give that little tip to you before I move on um, from personas. Then content strategy. So when it comes to educating, you have to think about what kind of content you're going to create that will help educate people. Um, I recommend using this content matrix um, where on one side or on, on the columns, you have uh, the buyer personas. If you have more than one, you can do more than one column. And then down the rows, you have your buyer's journey. So you can say problem awareness, solution research, decision making. What kind of content does my buyer need at each one of those stages? And then filling out the kind of content it is and what channels you're going to distribute that content to. Um, likewise, as a persona, I have a free mini course on my website and that one too. So feel free to check that out on my website, click courses. Um, it's called the content matrix and you can check that out. And then social selling. So, um, like I mentioned kind of on the why do digital sales, social selling is a great way to educate people, to push content out to your audience, educates them, entertains them and inspires them. So the way I recommend people do that is kind of look at it like a hierarchy approach. So bottom of the funnel or bottom of your hierarchy for social selling is just having a good profile, having some thoughtful content on it, having like professional, then moving on to connecting. So connecting with people, um, then engaging, clicking on posts, liking things, commenting on things, resharing other people's posts. Um, then you get to sharing where you're actually creating content. You're creating text posts, image posts, video posts. Um, you're actually putting content out there for your network to see. And then finally, leading, where you're actually doing things like thought leadership and you're an expert in your industry um, that can really promote yourself as being that thought leader. So there's kind of layers to social selling. Um, the last time I say it, I'll promise, I have another course on my website just on social selling. That's a huge course. It's about a 12-week thing to go through, but it's really good content. So if you're trying to look at social selling, I recommend checking that out too. But again, that's a big part of educating in this digital sales funnel. And then search engine optimization. So SEO, um, a lot of people are familiar with this um, and for good reason, it's a great way to get good inbound organic eyeballs on your content. 
Um, Cause your prospects are searching for things. And if you have good SEO and you have good content, you can be found for those things and you can add them to your digital sales funnel then. So um, when I'm looking at SEO, I look at the four pillars. So content, links, crawlability, user experience, um, this whole different conversation SEO, but just know as a big part of the edu education part of that digital sales funnel. And then you have events and webinars. Obviously you are on a webinar right now or LinkedIn live right now. Um, that's a great way to leverage digital technology to reach a lot of people. Um, you know, I, I have clients that are doing webinars with hundreds of people on a regular basis, very low cost, just the webinar software is all you need and the time to actually develop that content, but you can reach tons and tons of people that way and have them enter your digital sales funnel by doing these, these live events. Um, you can do them in person too. And I call that digital still because there's so much great software out there now that allows you to uh, do online registration for events and then have lead capture from the online registration, even if it's an in-person event too. So point here just being that a great way to educate people if you're not doing the asynchronous side of things as far as like um, email or blog posts, kind of more of a synchronous thing is doing live events uh, with your prospective customers. And then email campaigns. Um, I think email campaigns are underutilized by a lot of people. Um, you know, building out an email list and having an educational newsletter. Um, that's something that's a great way to stay top of mind for your customers by educating them on a regular basis, whether it be monthly, every other week, weekly, once a quarter. I wouldn't do it less than once a quarter as far as frequency goes. Um, but that's a great way to stay in front of people. Again, focusing on educational content, not sales content, on educational content. Obviously, you're going to have call to actions within there. Um, but the goal is really to be that resource and provide something of value so people get excited to open your emails or they forward them on to their coworkers because there's some great insight within that content too. So that is all of the education or education strategies that I outlined. Obviously, there's many other ways that you can educate your audience online. Uh, so I don't want to say that's kind of a you know fully inclusive list, but uh that's kind of the main strategies that I like to use with my clients and for me personally building uh, the businesses that I've worked on, uh, my personal business too. So then capture. The next stage here is to generate leads through call to actions that provide value. Um, and this is kind of where traditional digital sales and marketing kind of takes over and you're doing lead generation, lead nurturing, all that kind of stuff. So the goal here is to generate leads and this is where your measurement is gonna be on actual conversions into your sales pipeline. This is stuff that's going into Salesforce, is going into whatever CRM you use and you're just tracking it going forward. <clears throat> so components to kind of think about here, telling a brand story, having valuable call to actions, uh, working on your buyer's journey, utilizing a CRM, sales and marketing alignment and advertising campaigns. So again, we'll walk through each one of those things in a little more detail. So your brand story. Um, Anyone who knows me or has attended my, my recent content knows that I love Story Brand by Donald Miller. Um, if you haven't checked out that book yet, it's a great book, easy to read. His whole concept is telling a brand story um, and walking your prospective customer through their journey from being the uh, victim that's having an issue to being the hero at the end of the, at the end of their personal story, and you being that guide. So. The framework is there's a character that has a problem that meets a guide who gives them a plan, gives them a call to action that ends in success and helps them avoid failure. So you want to think about that for your business um, and what that looks like. And you might have more than one brand story. Um, again, I know I have some people from nonprofits uh, on this LinkedIn Live right now. So you might have donor stories. You might have patient stories or you know people that are being helped by you stories. Um, or if you're a for-profit business, you might have different verticals you work in or different personas that have the different stories. Um, I wouldn't try and create 20 different brand stories that you're working on, but I would say to make sure that you're focusing on the ones that are the biggest impact for your organization. So, and we'll go into too much more detail there, other than saying that you need to have a story that makes your customer the hero and you the guide that can help them along their journey. Um, and again, if you want to get more information on that, I recommend checking out the book Story Brand by Donald Miller. So valuable call to actions. You need to have lots of different call to actions across your digital ecosystem or across your digital platform. So your websites, your social medias, your email, any digital channel you have should have some sort of call to action on it. And there should be direct call to actions saying like buy now, book a meeting, 
you know, things like donate now, whatever it might be for your business. And then more of those transitional call to actions like sign up for my newsletter, download my guide, check out my webinar. Um, so things that allow people that aren't ready to buy to still have that more transitional call to action too. So I just have a screenshot from my LinkedIn profile. It says free digital sales guide. I click on that, it goes to a download page for a sales guide I have. You'll see that at the end of this webinar too. Um, but again, just think about different ways you can provide value through call to actions, both direct and more transitional. Then there's the buyer's journey. So making sure that you fully understand that buyer's journey that your customer goes through when they're buying from you. This is really important in this capture phase so that you can align the educational content you're creating for more of that problem awareness to the call to actions that you're creating as people go through solution, solution research and decision making and that you have the right content, the right call to actions, and that you're moving people down the funnel the right way as you capture them into your digital sales process. So this, this allows you to better guide them in a more strategic way with your content and with your strategy. So that's what that is. If you don't know buyer's journey stuff, you can just Google it. There's a lot of great templates out there um, related to building out or at least mapping out your, your buyer's journey for your business. And then utilize the CRM. Um, CRMs are great tools for sales and marketing teams. Um, I know a lot of organizations that use them really, really well. I know a lot of organizations that don't use them at all. Um, so they're really important though for this capture phase because it allows you to get really good data. So better data means you have better campaigns that you can run with your marketing team and your sales team. You have better pipeline management with your sales team, with your executive team, and just individually as a sales rep, you can better manage your pipeline. And there's a better customer experience, right? So if you have good data in a CRM that allows you to run smarter campaigns to existing customers that gets the right information in front of them, it helps upsell them on things they actually need, um, as well as follow up on prospects and things that are timely with information that's relevant. So um, if you don't have a good CRM strategy or you don't have good CRM adoption in your business, I highly recommend you sit down with your team and think about ways that you can better implement or better use your CRM tool. And then sales and marketing alignment, just like CRMs, are things that are really done really well or done very poorly. Um, so you want to make sure that your sales and marketing teams are aligned really well. And they're not going to see things eye for eye. They're not doing the exact same activity. So it's not always going to be perfect. But you just want to make sure they have shared goals and shared visions about how they're going to get there. So um, I always look at that, that you know both sales and marketing teams are all about trying to drive that top line revenue growth. Sales teams are more focused on individual prospects and trying to move them down the funnel, where marketing teams are more focused on the entire market and trying to get them to be aware of your brand, educate them and create that demand. Um, again, I, I can do a whole other webinar just on sales and marketing alignment, so I won't dive too much deeper there, but just know that's a really important part of that strategy, especially in that capture part of the funnel, because that's where your sales and marketing team have a lot of interactions together. And then advertising campaigns. Um, you know, most of the stuff we talked about so far is more organic, um, you know, non-paid type things, but paid campaigns are great, especially during that capture phase. So once someone's been educated by you or they're done doing their initial research, now it's time to capture a lead who has a higher intent of buying. So that's a great time to have capture campaigns, uh, as paid campaigns. So doing things like paid Google ads, paid social, um, I really recommend doing uh, retargeting ads. So people have seen your content already, targeting those people. I'll talk about that later down in this presentation too. Um, but just know that I recommend, you know, when at that capture phase, really focusing on paid content there or paid ads there, pay-per-click ads. That's a great time because someone's a higher intent at that point. They want to buy or they're, they're closer to buying. So it's a good time to kind of capture them in that funnel. So those are all the capture activities. Now we'll move on to consult. <laughs> so again, like I mentioned at the onset, the goal here is to sell the solution for your buyer. Um, and this really comes back to buyers who are digitally native don't want to be sold to. They want someone to help them. Going back to that brand story, they are the hero of their story. You are a guide that is helping them along on their journey. You have expertise. You have authority. You have a process that can help them buy. So your goal here is to be that consultative sales rep that moves them in from, I have a problem. I found some answers. Now I found a company that can help me. And, you know, can you please consult me one-on-one -on -one to help solve my problem? So the goal here is increase your sales. The measurement here is revenue. So these are different components that I broke out as good consult level things to focus on. So simplifying your buying process, solution selling, 
nurture campaigns, doing 80-20 analysis, pipeline insights, and then building your inner circle. So we'll pop through each one of these here too. So simplify the buying process. Um, this comes back to digitally native people are on digital platforms. They want to be simple. You can't have them jump through a bunch of hoops to move down that sales funnel and move into the buying process. So very clearly articulate what your steps are of how to buy from you. Do your pricing based on value. That makes things a lot clearer, especially that once you know the business and you know the problems and you know the impact, you can then value your solution based on the impact that you are helping either solve or you know neg neg negating some sort of bad thing that's happening to them. And then using technology to automate a good chunk of that buying process. Selling the solution. So really focusing on the why behind what they're buying and not necessarily the what behind what they're buying. So again, this comes back to being a good salesperson and being a good consultant, um, <clears throat> which means that you need to understand business, number one. Um, you can't have salespeople who don't understand business and understand the ROI of what they're doing. Um, and then number two, you need to be an empathetic listener. So not going into discovery meetings or into proposal meetings and trying to sell them and talk at them, but really listening to them, understanding their problems so you understand the root why behind why they're buying, and then proposing a solution instead of a product or a feature, proposing a solution that helps meet those needs. So again, really important part, this is more of a strategy side of things or more of a <clears throat> skills development for a, a sales rep um, than necessarily a, a tactic that you implement. But uh, again, something just to kind of think about in that lower down part of the digital sales funnel. Then you have nurture campaigns. So I love utilizing nurture campaigns uh, as a way to stay on top of mind for people that are already in your existing sales pipeline. So I already mentioned retargeted ads. Um, so again, if someone has been to your website, if they've downloaded things from you, if they've attended webinars of yours, if they've viewed blog posts, if they open emails of yours, nurturing them with follow-up campaigns. Um, again, this is why it's really important to have a good CRM that's tracking these things. Um, so you can very easily create those campaigns and have a list ready to go. Um, email drip campaigns. After you attend a webinar, you get these next two emails, things like that, that really kind of help uh, resell uh, over and over again. Because as you all know, it, you know, a lot of people don't buy in that first glance of something. It takes multiple iterations or multiple looks at a product or service before they're ready to buy. So email drip campaigns are a great way to do that, as well as retargeting campaigns, um, as well as asset offer, offer workflow, kind of a mouthful there, but basically sending multiple different assets. So a guide, then a webinar, then a blog post, things that show that you have lots of information, that you are an authority on this topic and that you can help them. All they have to do is come you know, consult with you one-on-one -on -one, and you'll find a solution for their business. So tons of different ways to do nurture campaigns, but I think they're really important again towards that bottom part of, of that digital sales funnel. <clears throat> A20 analysis, um, this is something that I'm very passionate about. <laughs> I like numbers, I like analysis. So um, this is a great way to understand what parts of your sales process are having the biggest impact on your results. So. If you don't already know the A20 principle, it's that 20%, sorry, let me rephrase that, 80% of your results come from 20% of your inputs. Um, so that's true of like 20% of your customers because 80% of your results, 20% of the mistakes in your process come, or sorry, 80% of the mistakes in your process come from 20% of your machines if you're a manufacturing company. If you're in marketing, a lot of times it means 80% of your leads come from 20% of your lead sources. So tons of different things to look at there. Um, so I recommend looking at customers, looking at products and services, looking at lead sources, looking at lost deal reasons, looking at your content, you know, which, which 20% of your blogs produce 80% of your views on your website. Um, <clears throat> why it's important during this consult phase is that you can start seeing what your top content is, what your top customers are. And once you know what your top performing things are, you can do a much better job consulting with customers because you know what issues to focus on, you know what content to give them, um, and it makes you a much more effective seller. So um, while this might not have to do directly with an individual sale, doing, you can't do an A20 analysis on individual sale, but by knowing these things in your individual businesses, um, statistics, or in your framework, you can then leverage your, your vital few, as they call it, you can lighter, level your, or you can leverage your vital few resources or ideas or customers and heavily use those during that consulting process with your customers um, as they move down that digital sales funnel. And then pipeline insights, um, somewhat related, 
So again, this goes back to having good data in your CRM. But if you have good data in your CRM, you can then leverage that information to understand your pipeline better. So how fast deals move through your pipeline, um, what size deals move through your pipeline and, and what stages they get stuck in. Um, what activities have the most impact on moving deals forward? So this kind of comes more back to like sales management, um, but really understanding insights from your pipeline so that, again, you can sell better. As people move down that pipeline, you know how deals move through and you get red flags. Like, hey, this deal's been stuck here for too long. What activities do I need to deploy with this customer to make it move forward? Um, I can go on a whole different rant about ways to do forecasting with pipeline activities. That if you have good pipeline data and you have good pipeline insights, you can actually forecast your average pipeline size and you know manage your sales team better that way too. Um, so a lot of good stuff there. But again, that kind of goes back to um, that capture phase and having good usage and good um, implementation of your CRM in order to pull that data for these insights. And then last but not least, um, as far as the strategy goes, is building your online inner circle. Um, this kind of relates back to social selling, but it's a little bigger than that too, because it's things like testimonials and online reviews, um, that when you're at that bottom of the funnel, uh, the sales funnel, digital sales funnel, having an online, what I call online inner circle of people that you're interacting with on a regular basis, that are providing reviews, providing testimonials, all of that stuff provides social proofs and provides referrals for you that bring in high intent, ready to buy customers that you can consult with and go with right away. And then kind of almost skipped the very top part of the funnel um, because you're bringing them in right at that social proof level through your online inner circle. So um, everyone's used to the idea of their inner circle and their personal lives and their friendships and their network from a professional standpoint. Um, and a lot of times professional networks bleed over from the physical world to the digital world too. Um, but I guess point being there that making sure you're active on social media, making sure you're active with the review sites and things like that, again, relevant to your industry so that you can start building out that social proof and start building out those people that are big champions of your content and that will speak well about you online and kind of become part of that network um, on a more uh, personal and a more effective basis as far as generating sales activity for you. So that's the consult side of things. <clears throat> now we've gone through the whole funnel. Hopefully it makes sense to you. Um, again, the very top is educate. I really, really recommend you put yourselves in the shoes of being your favorite teacher, right? So everyone's got that favorite teacher back in high school or college that no matter what they said or you know what class they taught, um, they were really good teachers and their education was really impactful for you. It was entertaining. It provided insights. You loved their class. You want to be that favorite teacher for your audience, um, which again goes back to knowing your personas and knowing who your students are. Um, but at the very top of the funnel, be that favorite teacher produce good content and have good online reach, then capture people through call to actions that provide value. And then finally consult those people one-on-one, -on -one, understand their problems, the impact it's having their business and providing a good solution. So that's the funnel. Again, goals and measurements here. Top of the funnel, it's all about getting impressions um, and expanding your reach. Middle of funnel, you're trying to generate leads, which you typically measure in conversions into your pipeline. And then number three at the bottom of the funnel, you have increase your sales, which the easy measurement there is just revenue uh, for your business. So that's the funnel. Uh, now we can start talking about how to actually start developing it uh, for your business um, and kind of deploying that strategy. <clears throat> so how to get started? Number one is just start by assessing your current state. Um, determine which parts of the digital strategy need improvement for your business. <clears throat> So I threw a lot of stuff at you there in those last couple of slides. Um, so think about the things that you know, hey, we're doing this really well. Um, so that I feel good about. What are the things we're not doing well that, you know, if we start implementing those things that might help us make our digital sales funnel more robust. From there, you can create your plan, outline what needs to be done and who needs to do it. Um, there's a lot of overlap here between sales and marketing. Um, and I, you know, the, the line is very blurred. Again, I, I like to kind of say that both sales and marketing focus on top line revenue growth. Sales is more on individual customers and uh, marketing is more on the market as a whole. But I realize that sales people definitely produce content that goes out to the entire market. And marketing people are trying to convert individual people. Uh, but it's really about having that, that understanding who's doing what in your organization and who's gonna champion which part of the digital sales funnel in that strategy. Once you have a plan, then it goes back to executing and iterating, right? So the whole idea of continuous process improvement, you execute, you, so you create a plan, you execute it, you review the data, and you decide what changes you wanna make and you do it all over again, right? So you just keep going over and over again 
and you look up, you know, six months, a year from now, you're going to be doing a really good job and you're going to start seeing a lot of results uh, in your digital sales strategy. Um, cheesy graph, but I love graphs, you know, uh, it's fun. Uh, exponential, there's an exponential potential. <laughs> Didn't say that out loud before. Um, but digital channels offer exponential growth um, because you do have the ability to use digital platforms, which scale, right? So if you go tell your sales team, go start making cold calls, there is a maximum number of leads that they can generate per an hour based on the number of calls they do. Um, so if you say go call 10 people, they might get one person on the phone. And then if you, if you say call 100 people, you might get one or two leads generated from it, right? So they can keep growing literally or literally uh, if they just keep calling more and more people. Exponential sales growth comes from digital content and it's not instant. We'll talk about time frame in a second here. Um, but, you know, the first 10 blog posts you do or first 10 social media posts you do, you might get no leads. But by the time you get to the 100th blog post, or you've been doing social selling for six months, you're going to start seeing exponential growth. It'll keep going faster and faster because your network will grow. Your search engine optimization will grow. Your email list will grow. And now every time you send that email, instead of hitting 10 people, you're hitting a thousand people. So this is a strategy that doesn't have the initial uh, impact that some analog sales things might do like cold calling or networking events, but over the long haul, you're going to see better results from it. So um, my next slide here is really all about, this is a marathon, not a sprint. Um, this is not something that you can say, oh, I'm going to go do digital strategy. And, you know, four weeks later, oh my God, look at all this success we're having. We're, you know, we're full, of, full of leads right now. That's not going to be the case. Um, you know, most of the time when I see working with customers is that you might start seeing results in the first two or three months, you might start seeing some results. Six months, you're going to be like, wow, this is starting to work. This is good. 12 months, a year into it, you're going to be like, this is a good strategy. I love doing this. And then you look up three to five years, it's, you know, a major part of what you're doing is your digital sales strategy. Um, and most of your leads are coming in via digital channels at that point too. So again, first things probably start seeing two or three months, six months, you start kind of getting on par. And then 12 months, you start seeing like, Hey, this is actually noticeable. I like this. This is good. And then three to five years, you're doing great. So again, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. And just like a marathon and not a sprint, it, you know, it, you have to train for it. You have to keep iterating on it. Um, some days suck. Some days you feel really good. Um, it's kind of that ongoing process of optimizing, creating content, doing it over again, expand your network, uh, moving forward that way. To help you in this process, I have a guide. Uh, so can I, we talked about that already a little bit. Uh, if you go to my website, uh, jroloff.com slash guide, uh, it's a downloadable guide. I outline all the things I talked about in this webinar. So kind of an outline of all those different, um, different components of the digital sales funnel. I also have a self-assessment that you can print at the end of the guide. Um, <clears throat> nothing too fancy, but kind of going through all the different components of what would make up a good digital sales strategy and just rating yourself zero to five, you know, zero, we're not doing it at all to five. Like we feel really good about doing this. Um, and then that allows you to then give yourself a rating so that maybe it might help you in your planning process to say, where should I even start in this process? Um, you know, let's start with educate because this, this is where we got the worst score or things like that. So again, this is guide, jrolloff.com slash guide. Um, and that is it. Um, some time to spare here for questions at the end. Um, but I appreciate you joining today. Hopefully the information I had was helpful and I will pause quick and drink some water while I wait for questions to come in. All right, we got a question from Dan. Uh, are funnels strictly conceptual or are there things that can grow and shrink? If you're a big company, do you have a big funnel? Um, I saw Dan had some great uh, content on LinkedIn today about sales funnels too, about if you're a hardware store and you're having a sale on sales funnels, is that part of your sales funnel? And or you're, if you're selling funnels and you're working at a hardware store, um, are, are, if you're having a sale on funnels, are that part of your sales funnel? Something like that. I like it. Anyways, long story short, Dan's talking about funnels. We're talking about funnels today. Um, so this question, yeah. I mean, you know, your digital sales funnel will drastically change depending on the size of your organization. Um, if you are a one-person company or a five-person company, um, you are, can have a much smaller scope of what you're doing in your digital strategy. 
Um, and I recommend, you know, again, going back to, to educate is probably the biggest part, the biggest time consuming part of a digital sales funnel. Um, if you're a small company, you might not be able to do webinars, email campaigns, blog posts, social selling, all these things really, really well. Focus on the things that you do do really well um, and make that kind of the biggest part of your lead generation process and then kind of add the things over time. Um, or on the flip side, if you're an enterprise organization with a 50 person marketing team and a you know 30 person sales team, um, you can do a lot with that. And you probably have different vendors and a big budget and you can really, really pump things up. Um, so it really does scale depending on your organization. Um, I recommend that people look at what they're good at, how they would naturally want to teach people, the kind of leads that might come naturally to them, um, that capture phase, and then their personal way of doing consultative selling, you know, picking up some good uh, selling books and learning from that, um, and then going from there. At the same time, I will also caution you not to be um, afraid to try something new just because you haven't done email campaigns in the past. You can't use the excuse that we're a small company, so we're not going to ever do email campaigns. You know, take that leap, learn that part of the process. Um, so don't don't be so timid where you're not going to try something new uh, as well. All right, Kevin asks, how do you align the buyer's journey with customer engagements? Um, <clears throat> so uh, I think I know what you're asking here, Kevin. It's really how do you... Um, add in different engagement points throughout that buyer's journey. Um, and that goes back to mapping your buyer's journey. So going, um, and I recommend having this as a group activity um, with probably your sales team and your marketing team and mapping out your buyer's journey. So the different stages, problem awareness, solution research, decision-making, um, and then you know post-purchase and going through some example accounts um, that you might've worked with. So maybe some of your top customers, again, going back to the 820 analysis, like who are top customers? And then going through and saying, okay, let's walk, th let's walk through a recent purchase that customer made um, and kind of plot some things in the buyer's journey. What questions did they ask during the problem awareness stage? What blog posts did they read? Which emails did they open? Um, and, or you know, a great thing to do is look at past emails that you might've gotten from that customer too. Um, and say, what questions were they asking us, either in the emails or in the sales process? Um, from the solution research phase, you know, what were the different options they were considering? Were they looking at competitors? Were they looking at doing it in-house? Um, how did we answer those questions? Um, what content did they consume there? Um, and then finally, obviously, decision-making, why they pull the trigger? What was that inflection point for them? What was the thing that made them move the needle from, no, it's not worth to buy. Yes, it's worth to buy. Um, so... I like mapping those things out in a conversation with your sales and marketing team um, so that you can use that and go back and say, okay, for our buyer's journey, these are the main engagement points that we found our top customers tend to go through uh, when they're buying from us. And again, it's probably going to be digital and analog. It's not just a digital sales strategy at that point. Um, but that's going to allow you to understand how your top customers buy and then aligning your strategy with trying to attract more customers like them. That's a great question. Here's another question. Uh, so who should be in charge of building digital sales strategy? Um, <clears throat> it depends on your organization. Um, I love it when sales teams can lead a digital sales strategy um, and they can partner with a digital marketing team or a team that, you know, their, their marketing team that loves doing digital too. Um, but a lot of times, again, it kind of comes back to there's different, there's different people that uh, have different skill sets within an organization. And sometimes it's on the sales team, sometimes on the marketing team. Um, but really going back to who's owning the goal, who's owning this process, having them own their part of the process, and then sharing common goals amongst your organization so that you can kind of work together to build that funnel up um, from start to finish. So good question. <clears throat> Uh, blah, 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 blah. Let's see, Dan. It's always kind of scary to put one of Dan's comments on there without reading it fully. Uh, I'm a, I'm a small business uh, person, uh, four person team. I love the UI of a good CRM. Does it make sense for me to use a CRM? Um, I just love the charts and graphs. See, that's <laughs> a Dan, Dan, Dan comment. Um, Dan, I also like charts and graphs. Um, yeah, I mean, I think you know, CRMs can be really. Um, hard to use and clunky and require, you know, administrators to even make them useful. I'm talking about Salesforce in that, in that matter. Um, if you're a small company, there's good CRMs that are targeted towards smaller companies too. So um, my kind of like three CRMs that I recommend across the board 
our pipe drive. So pipe drive is great for smaller businesses. I think that like one company to hundred pump company uh, size uh, business can do great with pipe drive. Um, they make it a very easy, good visual way to see deals move through the pipeline, really good contact management, um, really good support team that responds to emails and has live chat. So I love pipe drive um, for small businesses. Um, HubSpot is also great. Um, I think HubSpot kind of fills the role of like that middle size uh, CRM. It can also be used by small one person teams or four person teams in Dan's case, all the way up to enterprise um, businesses too. Um, so I personally have been using HubSpot recently, but again, it's, it's, it's good for all, all size companies. Um, cost wise, it's got a good price point too. Um, but it's a little bit more clunky than pipe drive, a little bit more features to kind of navigate around um, and potentially more this is over overkill for some, again, like I know Dan's a creative guy, um, does video work. So like it might be overkill for some of the stuff that he wants to do. Um, and then you have Salesforce at the enterprise level, kind of like the, the name brand that everyone knows the CRMs. I would not even remotely touch that for any kind of small business um, because you really need a good implementation of that. You need to have an administrator on staff that can do a good job with that too. They say they work with small, they say they work with small businesses, but like it's going to be more of a headache and more, more for you to work through too. Um, other names out there is one called Zoho, Z-O-H-O. -O. Um, that one's kind of like a weird Salesforce knockoff. Hopefully no one from Zoho is on this call, but uh, that one I'm not a huge fan of. Um, it's cheap. It's like Salesforce, but it's not as good as Salesforce. And um, I'd, I'd rather just go with HubSpot probably if I was in the market for Zoho. I don't see any other questions. So kind of last call for questions. Um, otherwise, check out my website. You can check out the guide there. Um, definitely email me with any questions. I'm always happy to meet with people and talk about their business um, and their strategy and what they're going through. Um, again, I've worked with hundreds of different clients over the years um, through the website design world and, and manage sales teams and stuff. So I'm, I'm always happy to talk about your specific uh, business and the strategy you're considering um, and pointing you in direction of different resources um, if that comes up. So Thanks again, everyone, and have a great day.